Good evening. I'm Janet Jacobson. I'm co-director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and I would like to welcome you to this evening's event in celebration of the publication of The Cunning of Gender Violence, Geopolitics, and Feminism. At the end of the event, we hope to post a slide with a QR code so that you can purchase the book, um, and um, we look forward to being able to talk about it tonight. We are here this evening with one of the editors, Lila Bulugod, and several of the con contributors to discuss the theme of securitization and the violence of law. This is the third in a series of discussions on different themes of this book. It's a big book with a lot to say. The first was hosted by our colleagues in the journalism school at Columbia, and the second held at Berkeley. And we are hoping to make them available together as a series on BCRW's YouTube page. In addition, this evening we have the honor to be joined by our esteemed colleague from the University of Texas at Austin, Karen Engel, who will respond to the book and the discussion and then lead the question and answer portion of our conversation tonight. Before we get into the content of that conversation, I'd like to announce one upcoming event at BCRW. We have a series, but this is the next one. Next Friday, we will host an in-person symposium on reproductive justice. It begins at noon on Friday with a keynote address by legal scholar Dorothy Roberts and is followed by panel discussions and workshops featuring among others, the Reproductive Justice Organization's Sister Song and our colleague at CUNY, Donna Ayn Davis. The symposium will coincide with the publication of the next issue of BCRW's web journal, Scholar and Feminist Online, featuring reflections on Dr. Davis's book, Reproductive Injustice. Just a few thank yous for this evening. I'd like to thank the BCRW staff, co-director Premalyn Addison, Hope Dector, Sophie Kreitzberg, and Kelsey Kitsky, who are making the online magic happen this evening, and our colleagues, Olivia Cummings, Pamela Phillips, and Sandra Moyano Aritza. Thank you to our co-sponsors at Columbia University, the Center for the Study of Social Difference, and the Center for the Study of Muslim Societies. I'd also like to thank COCO Language Advocacy and Consulting for our ASL interpretation tonight. This book is a product of a working group at the Center for the Study of Social Difference, which was led by Lila Bulugod, in which I had the honor to participate. I am deeply indebted to everyone who participated in this group. One of the great pleasures of our conversations was that the group included lawyers and journalists as well as scholars. And the project as a whole has had a profound influence on my own thinking about gender-based violence. I am trained as a scholar of religion and my contribution, because religion does something called religion cause gender-based violence, is concerned with the ways in which widespread presumptions about religion and violence may intersect with related assumptions about religion as somehow always conservative with regard to gender and sexuality. It is not. Yet together with these assumptions, the distinction between a supposedly dangerous religion and a supposedly rational secularism were deployed in the service of Islamophobia in US policy and public discourse, particularly in the furtherance of forever wars after 9-11. We have done multiple discussions for this book because of the complexity of these issues, and I thank my colleagues for the depth and seriousness of their scholarship and insights. I will now briefly introduce everyone who's here to speak with us tonight, um, and you can read their full bios on our website, bcrw.barner.edu. By the time you go there, it will probably be under past events, um, but I encourage you to explore their work further. And I will then turn it over to Lila Bulugod, who is the Joseph Butterweiser Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Center for the Study of Social Difference at Columbia to tell you more about this wonderful book. Following Lila will be Vasuki Nasaya, who teaches human rights, legal and social theory at NYU Gallatin, where she is also faculty director of the Gallatin Global Fellowship in Human Rights. Vasuki is a founding member of Third World Approaches to International Law. Rafia Zakaria is an author, editor, and attorney. She is a fellow at the African American Policy Institute and a weekly com columnist at the Baffler in the United States, as well as for Dawn, Pakistan's largest and oldest English language daily. Shinila Kojamuji is the Hamid bin Khalifa 
Altani, Associate Professor of Muslim Societies at Georgetown University. And finally, our discussant is Karen England Ingle, the Minerva House Drysdale Regents Chair in Law and founder and co-director of the Barnard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice. She is also an affiliated faculty member of Latin American Studies and of Women's and Gender Studies. So once again, with thanks for everyone who is here this evening, everyone who participated in this book, and particularly to Lila Bulugo for her leadership of this project, I turn it over to Lila. Hi, uh, thank you, Janet, uh, and thank every, everyone uh, for joining us this evening. Um, I wanted to say a few words at the start, a few more words uh, about the multi-year international collective project that birthed this book. A group of us were pushed to this project by our observation that some versions of feminism had gained success over the past few decades in making global institutions and policies take, take violence against women, gender-based violence, and later sexual violence seriously. And as scholars, uh, ethnographers, journalists, and uh, lawyers and activists who focused on the everyday lives of people and the politics of gender, religion, and violence in South Asia, in the Middle East, and where Muslim immigrants from these regions now live in the West, each of us found ourselves troubled. Uh, troubled by the ways feminist visions were being codified deployed by human rights and other international organizations, entering into state and foreign policy, and mobilized to support some troubling interventions in international and domestic affairs, from military invasions to airport surveillance. And the harnessing of feminism to military, humanitarian, and selective legal intervention with its accompanying media representations in the name of protecting women alerted us to some problems. What were the implications of the apparent mainstreaming of a feminist agenda against violence? How was this playing itself out in particular places and projects? What were the gains? What were the costs? And we gave a name uh, to the institutionalized, institutionalized apparatuses, vocabularies, categories, technologies, and agendas of what Janet Halley and her colleagues have called governance feminism. We called it GBVAW, a capitalized acronym, GBVAW. And we asked how GBVAW was related to small g gender violence, referring to what we and all of us must care about, which is complex intersecting forms of violence on the ground. And because of where we come from and where we work, we had to confront the ways religion and racialized identity, particularly the Muslim question, as we came to think of it, ran deeply uh, through the international governance structures and media dedicated to combating gender-based violence and violence against women. And Janet's already talked about the way it works in the US. Now, um, the Hegelian concept of cunning captured for us the ways that a well-meaning and visionary feminist commitment to end or at least address all forms of gendered violence has got folded into contemporary world affairs, attaching itself to major vectors of institutional and political power. And as Janet mentions, this is the third part of our public launch of this book, the first at the School of Journalism, uh, Columbia looked at the civilizational industries that intervene in other parts of the world in the name of humanitarianism and development. The second at the University of California in Berkeley looked at state violence as gender violence. And today we're focusing on the chapters in this book that look at the violence entailed in legal regulation, both national and international in a world dominated by security speak. So I'll talk about my chapter first, and then you'll hear from others. So my chapter was called Securo Feminism, Embracing a Phantom. And I was first made aware of the problem that I tackle when a Columbia SIPA 
student at, from the School of International Public Affairs, who is now working at an NGO on girls empowerment, asked me how she could make an argument to the United Arab Emirates delegation at the UN for support for her NGO through linking girls leadership to CVE. And I was ignorant at the time. And I said, what's CVE? It turns out it was countering violent extremism. And she said it was the only funding priority available. Uh, so this led me on a path of discovery. I was an anthropologist who'd written a book uh, that questioned the feminist enthusiasm for a US military invasion of Afghanistan in the name of saving Muslim women. Uh, but since then, um, since I discovered CVE, and since that time, uh, legions, I discovered that legions of gender experts and women's rights advocates have been clamoring for inclusion and even leadership in CVE or PVE. So it's countering violent extremism or preventing violent extremism, PVE. And I, I think uh, this has had its heyday, actually. Uh, but we can talk about that. Uh, but I gave a name to this heterogeneous group, and I called them secure feminists because they were working within the framework and the institutions of security. And I felt that um, they were wittingly or unwittingly embracing a phantom in the undefined and undefinable cate category of violent extremism. In accepting this term, I saw them fueling Islamophobic public discourse. And even when they insistently, and they usually did, disavowed it, the vilification of Muslim men, especially. So secure feminists align themselves with women's rights, with human rights, with the UN peace and security agenda. And as you'll hear later from Vasuki, many are part of what she has called international conflict feminism. But in accepting the ground rules of securitization as a political modality, I think they were endangering women and men on the ground around the world. And that's what worried me. And so what I did, it, and in the spirit of feminist internal critique, because I am a feminist and grounded in my own lifetime of research in and on parts of the Muslim world, in my chapter, I challenge the twin premises of secure feminism. First, its acceptance of the category violent extremism and its self-justifying deployment of the charge that extremists are perpetrators of extreme forms of gender-based violence. Why challenge this? Because the category has no explanatory value for understanding politics, and because they downplay, downplay the extremity of so many forms and sources of violence that we should all care about. So some grassroots Human rights advocates and critical scholars of international and human rights law have cautioned about the risks of this engagement with security. I am not the first. But whether because of the extraordinary opportunities CVE opened up to feminists for influencing policy, for attracting funding, for bolstering careers, or because of uh, the longstanding hostility mainstream feminists and not just in the West have towards religion, as Janet mentioned, with I think a special animus towards Islam, or because of the dominance of carceral feminism in the international arena, or simply because I began to think because they've been worn down by the numbing repetition of terms and frameworks that have accompanied the global security agenda's growing hegemony, these critiques just haven't had much traction. So secure feminists, when I went into their world, they find themselves in a world of undefined terms, trite advertising campaigns, shoddy studies, and their acceptance of stock terms and categories makes it almost impossible for them to challenge the hegemony of securitization or to examine the historical roots, the context, 
and dynamics of the violences that mark everyday lives. Violent extremism is a phantom, but it has very real effects. And the most obvious of these is to justify militarized security and surveillance that demonizes Muslims, Muslim men, but even Muslim women. Now, what, what, why do I say this? That it has no meaning. Extreme is a relative term. What's its opposite? Moderate? Many consider resort any resort to violence extreme. Pacifists, feminist critics of war, those who work against the patriarchal norms of masculinity and male dominance in politics, they've long organized against violence in the home, the prison, the international sphere. And as someone who watched uh, the shock and awe, shock and awe of the US invasion of Iraq 20 years ago now, I fear the extreme violence carried out by powerful, well-equipped armies, by bombers, by drones, by proxy militias, their effects on people and communities and women have been catastrophic. So my point in the chapter is that violent extremism is as much of an empty signifier as is its partner term, radicalization, that was so popular in European policing. Its deployment reduces complex political and historical dynamics to simple problems with pat solutions, uh, best practices, you name it, depoliticizing and decontextualizing violence while dehumanizing certain groups or communities. The question is always, what's the alternative? And I try to offer some suggestions in my chapter I think feminists might work to pressure powerful, extractive security states to change course and pursue political rather than military solutions. I would want to talk about banning global arms production and sales. I'd like to see us seeking ways to limit massive destruction, injury, deprivation, and death. I'd like to see global resources reallocated and shared for the good of people and the planet, education, welfare, these are all feminist issues. Uh, and so when even the most thoughtful, secure feminists justify their involvement in CVE by charging violent extremists with engaging in extreme gender-based violence, which is what they argue, they enter a field that's well furrowed by right-wing Islamophobes, none of whom, you can be sure, are feminists. Gender-based violence and misogyny are not, sadly, the monopoly of any particular group. And we've seen the fallout when they're used as alibis for war. We saw it for Afghanistan. We've seen it for Iraq. And I think the same could be said for the deadly forms of force, gendered and human, that CVE countering violent extremism actually inflicts. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Vasuki Nesea, and um, thanks to Janet, uh, Lila, and everyone else uh, organizing this. Um, and uh, I'm also conscious of time, so I'll um, I'll jump right in. Um, and I sort of start uh, a, a bit where Lila ended up about the worries about a large-scale military action. Um, in January 2013, citizens of Kona and Diable in central Mali in West Africa found themselves being bombarded by French air strikes in the name of counterterrorism. Termed Operation Sawal in French military speak, Francois Hollande described the military operation as support for Malian troops in confronting terrorism. As you know, Mali was formerly a French colony, and that is part of the longer backstory to those air strikes. More immediately, however, Operation Sawal had both a regional backstory, linking military escalation of CVE activities in Libya and other parts of the Sahel, 
and a global backstory where there has been an ongoing escalation of military, cultural, and legal interventions linking Islam to violent extremism in Mali, in France, and elsewhere in Europe, and in the US, of course. Mali became the seventh Muslim-majority country where the Security Council members and their allies had launched a military attack in the preceding four years. I was, and still am, interested in how international law gets invoked in military operations, operations such as a French airstrike in Mali 10 years ago. In a familiar sequence, the planes carrying bombs were soon followed by planes carrying emissaries from the International Criminal Court, or the ICC, as the court is known. The ICC launched an investigation into the situation in Mali that same month, where their attention trained on the same targets as France's Operation Sawal. This paper takes as its starting point the International Criminal Court charges that emerge from that investigation. I focus particularly on the much celebrated charge that was brought against Mr. Al Hassan Mahmoud of Timbuktu, Mali, for a range of crimes, including religious persecution and gender persecution. The focus was on actions undertaken in his role as chief of the Islamic police and member of Ansar Deen, an insurgent paramilitary group in northern Mali. The International Criminal Court issued a warrant for the arrest of Mr. Hassan in March 2018. He surrendered in a matter of days, and the trial has been unfolding in The Hague since July 2020. Both parties made closing statements in May of this year, and the ICC trial chamber is deliberating and a decision may come at any time. The statute of the International Criminal Code inaugurated the codification of gender-based persecution as a crime, and this case is the first substantive interpretation and application of these provisions. Feminist groups immediately voiced support for the ICC's case against al Hassan and applauded the ICC's charge sheet as groundbreaking. It is striking that gender-based persecution charges have traveled only as companions to contexts where religious-based persecution charges are co-travelers, and thus far only where that religion is Islam. This became increasingly important in situating the slippage between Islam and violent extremism in much of the related feminist commentary on persecution charges. My paper does not deal with Mr. Hassan's guilt or innocence. Rather, my focus is on what the case tells us about the relationship between what I call international conflict feminism, between the field of countering violent extremism, CVE, as um, Lala described it, and lawfare. The paper is basically studying the relationship between these three projects, international conflict feminism, countering violent extremism, and lawfare. And in fact, that's part of the title of the paper. Before moving further, um, these are all shorthand, so let me just quickly define each of these three projects very briefly. So first, international conflict feminism, so it's a term I'd coined, which refers to a repertoire of policy agendas and legal agencies focused on so-called conflict zones. Um, ICF, international conflict feminism, focuses on women's vulnerability to fight impunity for sexual violence and promote women's role in peace-building processes. ICF emerged from feminist networks anchored in the global north that gained momentum in the aftermath of the Cold War. While ICF has had remarkable uptake in many institutions of global governance, international criminal courts and tribunals have been especially receptive to ICF agendas. Lawfare, the second um, project, speaks to the normative legitimacy producing work that we attribute to legal terrains that does work on the battlefield. Law is not just a tool of war, although that too, but as part of what NATO describes as a whole of society strategy for rule of law projects. Situating CVE initiatives, not as military interventions, but as a law and justice intervention. Often these framers of these projects link particular systems of law to counterterrorism goals, to CVE. And finally, CVE, which refers to a sort of an updated version of counterterrorism policies, CVE was promoted as a hearts and minds complement to military anti-terrorism activities, or as the Center for Security Studies describe it, as both hard and soft measures. So ICF, Lawfare, and CVE have transnational currency in the current moment. 
that currency feeds off dominant structures of global governance and makes their driving logics the thinkable default option and renders their legitimacy a matter of common sense for diverse groups, from feminist lawyers to military strategists. The synergy between the force fields of counterterrorism, lawfare, and international conflict feminism was itself a force multiplier in creating the space for the Al-Hassan case and the coming together of gender and religious persecution. By describing these three force fields that were the backstory to the Al-Hassan case, this chapter sought to lay the groundwork for analysis of how gender gets defined, fixed, and troubled by the court proceedings at various moments and how this in turn channels how Islam and Islamic societies gets coded and interpolated. So analyzing this case in relation to these three coordinates is the main goal of this paper. I also had four other related goals. Firstly, I was also interested in the continuities and discontinuities between everyday Islamophobia, as it reveals itself in domestic politics in a country like France, for instance, regarding the whale ban or forced marriage or Sharia hysteria um, and geopolitics. So the domestic and the geopolitical, the Islamophobia that drives the military offensive of the West in primarily Islamic countries. Another theme is that one dimension of lawfare today is not just the mobilization of law as an instrument of war, but that lawfare presents itself as a battle between liberal legalism and alternative legal systems, especially Islamic legal systems. In fact, as I discuss in the chapter, in some cases, liberal rule of law talk may describe Islamic law as by definition a system of criminality rather than legality. There's sort of a Sharia hysteria. I developed this in the uh, chapter itself, particularly in relation to how forced marriage um, and arranged marriage um, and sexual um, slavery gets, get discussed. A fourth theme is a debate that is perhaps for particular interest to international law folk. Um, and that is in terms of the International Criminal Court and the politics of the International Criminal Court. In the first phase of the International Criminal Court on the world stage, it was overwhelmingly focused on African countries and was charged with having racist prosecutorial priorities. I suggest that in its second phase, the ICC seems to be characterized by an overwhelming focus on Muslim majority countries including those in Africa, such as Libya and Mali. A final theme is about how the term intersectionality has been appropriated and flipped um, in this process. This case has been celebrated for bringing an inter intersectional perspective because of the intertwined charges of religious persecution and gender persecution. I want to draw attention to how originally in the history of critical race theory, intersectionality was an important vantage point for vulnerable groups to hold powerful actors accountable. Accordingly, the vantage point was a bottom-up heterodox feminist perspective aimed at better illuminating the nature of oppression and its complexity. Yet in this case, intersectionality is invoked in defense of an ICC prosecutorial policy allied with NATO's counterterrorism operations. So no longer a bottom-up feminism as it were. Okay, in conclusion or in summary, um, by saying what I've uh, saying saying that all of the ideas I have outlined um, comes out of my interest in how the convergences of religious and gender-based persecution charges raises questions about how women's rights discourse and feminist projects become conscripted into colonial, racialized, Islamophobic tropes that connect the dots between battlefields and courtrooms, judges and generals. This chapter looks at the political purchase of international conflict feminism in helping constitute the normative framework guiding and legitimizing laws and policies advanced under the rubric of CVE and how these have intersected with the work of the International Criminal Court in new modalities of lawfare that have taken place against the backdrop of Security Council action, including its military interventions in Muslim majority countries. This analysis comes together in reading the Al-Hassan case at the ICC as a grain of sand through which we examine the universe at the crossroads of Sharia panic, sex panic, and security panic. Thank you. I'll stop there.
Hello. Um, Rafia Zakaria uh, had hoped to join us, was on a plane and hoping to land in time uh, to be here with us, but uh, is not here. And so she sent along a letter uh, that um, she asked us to read. So um, I will now read what uh, Rafia has written um, as an address to all of us. Dear friends, I am especially grateful to Dr. Lila Bulukod for having given me the opportunity to contribute to this volume. As you may know, my particular chapter is about Operation Limelight, a Trump era surveillance program that was alleged to protect young Im immigrant girls from FGC, also known as female genital cutting. Per this information available, Operation Limelight involved ICE agents randomly stopping families at the airport and providing them with information regarding how FGC is a crime in the United States. When the Trump administration wrapped up this program, um, it was underway at the nine largest international airports in the country. There has never been any information provided about how people were singled out, um, they were supposedly randomly given information, or even what exactly ICE agents said to the people they accosted. The details are, of course, available in the full-length book chapter, but in this brief letter, I would like to highlight two major points. One, the continuing obstacles in trying to place writing and discussion about FGC in the United States. This is placing journalistic um, writing about these issues, the, the challenge of getting journalistic editors to publish about this topic. The assumption is that anyone who critiques anything around FGC must inherently be for FGC, uh, a misogynist and also unsupportive of human rights. It is precisely of this that a right-wing government like that of Donald Trump could cleverly use the language of human rights and of protecting girls to essentially give ICE agents the blanket ability to stop and question and even interrogate people who they assume were from affected countries. In essence, what was being passed as surveillance against FGC could, because of vague language and being an administrative regulation rather than the law, could be used to surveil for that and for any other purpose. The lack of details, including the use of a defunct NGO, in the pamphlet that was allegedly being passed out further suggests that this was a vague language that allowed for any ICE action that was deemed necessary by the agents at the airport. The second point is the question of what was and is being done with any data that was collected. At the same time as these girls and their parents were being given information, the Trump administration had also begun a program to begin denaturalizing U.S. citizens of immigrant or origin. Once again, the administration had said that those guilty of human rights violations, such as FGC, could be denaturalized. Could it be that the program was a means to collect data on largely African and South Asian families such that they could possibly be flagged as potential denaturalization candidates? The most problematic bit is that ultimately the only way to confirm FGC has taken place is, as, is through a physical exam. ICE agents often take subjects for interrogation into private rooms. Girls were at risk of being examined in this way. There are Western countries such as Sweden that do in fact do this. As you might be able to imagine, it is traumatizing and terrorizing to be accosted by ICE agent, agents at all. Imagine then agents having the power to examine the genitalia of your female children. I hope that people who read this book and decide to consider FGC as an issue related to female bodily autonomy rather than what white or Western interests may consider good or bad. This last bit is particularly important because the regulations that Operation Limelight were carried out under still remain on the books. Because it is an immigration regulation, the Trump administration could promulgate it without having to bother about le legislation. I hope listeners will consider purchasing the book. I didn't know that there was gonna be an ad for the book, but you can also send comments to um, Rafia at her Gmail address. 
Um, and she says, once again, thank you. Um, and uh, we just very much appreciate her willingness to send this along, even though she herself was not able to be here um, and join us this evening. It's always a measure of um, commitment and uh, professionalism when people are willing to do whatever they can to fulfill their commitments to participate. And we thank her very much. And I believe that Shanila will uh, share her chapter with us next. Hello, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I want to begin by thanking Professor Laila Abulagot for bringing us together and for curating this volume on a very important topic. My chapter is entitled The Politics of Legislating Honor Crime in Contemporary Pakistan. In the chapter, I examine feminist mobilization around the killing of a social media celebrity Kandil Baloch, to notice how the category of honor crime was helpful to coerce the state into passing an amendment that had stalled in the parliament for several years. But I note that in appealing to the state, such forms of feminism reiterate the state as a purveyor of women's well-being, effectively masking the state's complicity in creating the legal conditions for women's subordination in the first place. And so in the chapter, I highlight this conundrum with the hope that we can hopefully have conversations about alternatives. So let me share some background. On July 15, 2016, Kandil Baloch, a social media celebrity known for her sexually provocative videos, was strangled to death by her brother, Basim. He gave her a sleeping pill and then choked her to death with the help of two accomplices. Speaking later at a press conference, Wasim explained that he killed her because her videos were bringing dishonor to his family. The news of this incident spread like wildfire in Pakistan, making Kandil a household name. In life, Kandil had been a minor celebrity, if that. But the manner of her murder catapulted her to global fame. She was instantly framed as yet another victim of honor killing, which a newspaper claimed is, quote, a scourge in most Muslim countries and is carried out with impunity in Pakistan." Unquote. Asad Jamal, a lawyer who fought on behalf of a rare victim of such an attempted murder said, if a brother murders his sister or a father murders his daughter, the first possible reason would be honor. So you can see that Kandil's murder fit these frames neatly and it was instantly termed as an honor killing and interpreted as a violation of her rights to live as she pleased. While women in Pakistan have been agitating against gender-based violence for decades, in the years leading up to Kandil's murder, mobilization around honor killings had actually gained momentum. What troubled activists was that such cases were often tried under the Kisas and Diyat ordinance, which permitted the assaulted person, or more likely the family, to either punish the perpetrator in a like manner or demand monetary compensation. Oftentimes, perpetrators of honor killings who were by definition frequently family members, they were forgiven by the family of the victim. So this ordinance transformed women's murder when linked to honor from a crime against the state to a crime against the person. Women's rights activists had therefore been calling for addressing this legal loophole, particularly through amendments. Introduction of amendments is a popular activist strategy for dealing with liberal bureaucracies. It allows them to build on infrastructure that is already available. While opportunistic, such strategies are often the most immediate ways to provide relief. In 2014, therefore, Senator Sogra Imam introduced a criminal laws amendment, which called for increasing the penalty for offenses committed in the name of honor. It also gave the courts authority to reject compromises made by the victim's family. Specifically, it stipulated that the family could not pardon the perpetrator. This bill passed through the Senate in 2015, but stalled in the parliament later that year. Momentum for the bill increased in 2016 when a documentary by a leading filmmaker, Obeid Chanoy, that featured a rare survivor of honor killing was nominated for and later won an Oscar. Obeid Chanoy also started a petition to gain signatures in order, in order to show the then prime minister, Nawaz Sharif, the will of the people. She circulated her message through newspapers, television, radio, and social media. 
Sharif eventually invited her to meet him and publicly announced his support for her activism. He said, customs and practices such as honor killings have nothing to do with the divine principles and theories of Islam. It was Islam which first recognized the rights of women. Women are the most essential part of our society, and I believe in their empowerment, protection, and emancipation. In these remarks, Sharif skillfully erases the state's longstanding complicity in sanctioning violence against women through legal loopholes, which too are interpretive moves made by the judges to bring the law into alignment with the scripture. In fact, it was during Sharif's tenure in 1997 that the Kisas and Diet ordinance passed in the parliament. He instead here conceals the interpretive moves made by his government that had that made these, um, these sort of uh, legislators and laws. In doing so, Sharif continues to grant the state moral authority over women's lives and debts. It's precisely this authority that Kandil undermined. So in the chapter, I talk about how she mocked politicians for being corrupt, and she called out the hypocrisy of religious elites, particularly the ulama. Sharif ultimately committed to closing the legal loophole, and just as the negotiations were taking place, Kandil was murdered. The murder gave further momentum to activist troubles, so much so that within a few months, the amendment passed in the parliament. Sharif emerged from this episode as a benevolent patriarch and an advocate for women's rights. Blame, instead, was shifted onto backward others who engage in inappropriate interpretations of Islam. To avoid making honor crimes a simple villain for feminists, Laila Abulagov has argued that it's important to pay attention to the specificities of the violence under consideration, as well as the political and social conditions in which violence against women is occurring. With this in mind, in the chapter, I go on to tell a different story about Kandil. I examine her own media performances to provide a thick description of her political critiques and circumstances that led to her killing. This story turns out to be less about her family and their shame and more about Kandil's politicized contestation of the state and religious elites and the naming of male lust as an organizing principle in Pakistani society. Her critiques threatened specific men and were inflamed by the local media. She called out certain ulama, media personalities denigrated her for her working class background, and the state failed to provide her protection when she asked for it. Paying attention to these storylines undermines an easy reduction of her murder to the seductive category of honor killing, and it instead shows that local hegemonies, besides those of the family, were too at play in this murder. The discussion in this chapter does not imply that feminist activist efforts are not laudable. These activists have been able to push a crucial amendment. However, what I hope to highlight is this conundrum where activists end up appealing to the very entity that has constrained the lives of women through legal measures in the first place and by, and by seeking an expansion of carceral ecologies. Furthermore, according to some political analysts, the reformed law has not had its desired effects. It's reported that some murderers do not mind jail time to protect their own or their family's honor. I conclude this chapter by outlining the work of some other activist groups, particularly the Orat March and Girls at Taba, that have tried to move beyond the category of honor killing to name the multiple intersecting forces that shape women's lives in Pakistan. These activists assert their right to assembly through protest and in doing so become the very bodies in public that the state and religious elites um, get nervous about. They also point to a feminist politics of abolition instead of inclusion within status apparatuses or expansion of the carceral state. But we have limited sense of what such a feminist politics might look like beyond ending prisons. That said, we're so lucky to have Karen Engel with us today because she's reflected on some of these issues. And so I will pass it on to Karen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shanila. And I warn you, I'll turn it back to you in a moment on that very question. So I want to echo the thanks to Laila Abalugod for the invitation to participate today. 
And to her and her co-editors, Rima Hamami and Nadira Shalhub Kavorkian, for editing this outstanding collection. And I'm you know, going to just show you the old fashioned way. If I get it on the camera, here's the book that you all should go out and buy. Um, so I also want to thank Janet Jacobson, our fabulous ASL interpreters, Glashonda and Tricia, and the Barnard Center for Research on Women. It's a real honor to be on this side of the video stage. Um, I'm in awe of so much of your excellent programming and tune in for it. Um, and of course, it's wonderful to be here with Vasudhi Nasaya, with whom I've had the um, opportunity to collaborate for many years, and Shanila Koja Mulji, and uh, to have met with, but uh, and now hear the letter from Rafia Zakaria and to talk about all of your work. So thank you so much for your terrific work, your chapters, as well as the presentations. Now, anyone who has ever authored or edited or even authored a chapter in an edited collection knows that it takes an enormous amount of thought and work. And that's often not appreciated or is underappreciated in the academy. It particularly takes a lot of work if, like the cunning of gender violence, it makes a coherent argument and an important intervention or many in the extant literature. And even more so, um, it it's, takes a lot of work when, as this book does, it brings in multiple disciplines and considers various sites around the world. So Lila gave you a great statement of the overall argument of the book um, earlier this evening, and its identification and analysis of the role of feminists in perpetuating the dominant securitized, racialized, and imperial approaches to gender violence. And the five very rich chapters that you've heard discussed this evening give you a good sense of some of the book's interventions particularly, but not only about those that we're focusing on, um, securitization and the violence of law. So in my few moments this evening, minutes, I thought I'd pull out a few themes from these various chapters and ask some questions of the group that we can discuss all together. And I confess there are questions that I have often asked myself or have been asked. So, um, and I only have tentative answers to them if that. So I'm taking advantage of being the respondent questioner here uh, to try to enrich my own thinking on these issues. So I'll just talk about three um, basic areas. So first will be the role about criminal law and possible responses to it. Second is about the role of feminism in securitization and the violence of law. And third is about the extent to which the book or some of the chapters might rely on the categories of good Muslims or good religion. Um, and I think as you'll see, these questions um, obviously overlap in some ways. So first, in terms of the role of criminal law. Criminal law plays an important role in each of the chapters that we've heard about this evening. Perhaps most obviously in Basuki's discussion of the Al-Hassan case before the ICC, Rafia's consideration of the prosecution of a doctor in Michigan for genital cutting, which is how she starts the chapter, um, as well as the various types of surveillance of immigrants that that criminalization permits. And Sheila's discussion of the Kandil Bullock case. Now, it's not surprising that criminal law is so prevalent because as Lila discussed in describing secure feminism, carceralism is key to the mode of governance that much contemporary feminism has adopted, particularly in response to violence against women. That's true in most domestic contexts, and I think it's terrific that we have a combination here of the domestic and the international in terms of the institutions and their responses. Um, so it's true in most domestic contexts, as well as in their international law and policy, where criminal convictions are often relied upon to demonstrate, as I think Basuki's chapter shows, uh, the violence against women that in the case of calling something persecution, it's a way of saying that it's near, it's, it's almost genocidal. So that's the closest they can get to a genocidal conviction without genocide. 
Now, the chapters all demonstrate different consequences of a reliance on criminal law, especially when done in the name of protecting women from what's considered religious extremism. Um, and those consequences range from the issues and complexities that criminalization elides to the ways in which criminal law often operates as an alibi for not recognizing or attending to the deeply structural colonial racialized and gender violence in which states and international institutions themselves participate. So I'd love to hear a bit more from each of the speakers about whether you see the difficulties you identify as central to criminal punishment regimes, or whether you're more concerned about the overreach of criminal law, the ways in which it's entangled with religion, or perhaps it just doesn't seem like the right fit for the particular, and I'll say the small g gender issues that you name. And Lila asked me to put some of my own cards on the table. So I'll say I'm currently writing about what I insist are the conflicting projects of penal abolition and mainstream human rights advocacy, highlighting the extent to which the latter relies heavily on criminal law. And I'm attempting to push human rights advocates, especially but not only those working on gender and race in an abolitionist direction. So part of that question, of course, is that I'd love to hear any of those who would like to talk about it, about your take on abolition. Um, and I ask not only because of my own interest, but as Sheila ended her talk and her chapter, um, you could hear that she's focusing on the work of some feminist activists in Pakistan, Pakistan whom she identifies as having a feminist politics of abolition, um, which actually it, it, in the discussion, I think is not only about anti-carceralism, but also anti-statism. In Janet's chapter, although you didn't get to hear that um, part this evening, uh, actually, well, she pushes for feminists not to rely on the secular state to respond to gender-based violence. And when she does that, she proposes some other models that feminists might consider, and one of those includes restorative justice. Okay, the second question or general area I'd like to discuss is about the role of feminism in securitization and law. The book project in each of the chapters that we've just heard discussed have within them a critique of particular feminist actors, and at times a type of feminism but there's little discussion of the actual feminist theory that drives the views. Sometimes the chapter suggests that the feminist actors get feminism wrong, and other times that they're pursuing a particular feminist theory with which the authors disagree. But I'd love to see that connection between the feminism and the politics teased out a little bit more. So again, in my own work on the grip of sexual violence in conflict on international legal feminist approaches, I resist suggesting that feminism or feminists were simply co-opted, though sometimes it certainly seems that way. In that context, which I think would apply to many of the cases here, although I'd love to discuss that, I insist that a particular strand of structural feminism, or perhaps some of you might call it radical feminism, prevailed. And that was one that saw sexual domination as central to women's oppression by men, and thus as constituting the principal harm to women in general, and especially in wartime. Now, when those structural feminists debated other feminists about a variety of issues, sexual violence was gender violence for them and vice versa. And then that language of sexual violence resonated with political and institutional actors across political, national, cultural, and religious lines. So I'd love to hear from at least some of the authors about your take on the feminisms that have become dominant in the areas you study. What is their feminist theory? Where did those groups originate? And are they tied to acts with which you disagree or have the actors you're concerned about wrongly co-opted feminism? And I'd also love to hear your thoughts, maybe some others, on what might have happened to other feminist strands with which you might be more sympathetic. And 
So for me, the women's peace movement is one that I'm interested in. And I think Lila uh, sort of uh, gestured at that toward the end. And the question would be, did those strands acquiesce in or were they silenced, defeated, or simply pushed to the background by what have become the dominant feminisms? I think here of Nancy Fraser's statement that we, quote, can neither simply embrace nor wholly disavow what she then calls the strange shadowy version of the feminisms that we see in those that have come to govern. And then finally, I want to think about the extent to which the book and some of the chapters rely on the category of good Muslims or good religious actors and whether and how we might escape that dichotomy. So Janet's chapter in the book, and I think you got a good sense of this, uncovers and analyzes the effects of the common sense understanding of the relationship between religion and gender-based violence. By showing how it constructs and depends upon and, and she actually says a three-way division between good, reasonable religion and secularism on the one hand and bad, unreasonable religion on the other. And of course, she resists that division. Other chapters also resist it in various ways, but I think sometimes face a difficult task in doing so. And I don't know if Rafia will make it for the Q&A, but I think particularly of this in relation to her chapter, as she argues against the surveillance that profiles entire groups as potentially criminal. And I suspect that's a critique that most of us have made in one context or another, I certainly have. One of the effects of overcriminalization or surveillance though, is that it leads people to attest to their goodness or their innocence. So they have to become good Muslims or good immigrants or the like. And those engaged in surveillance often depend upon those um, declarations of goodness and the, and the intelligence um, that might come from that. And perhaps more concerning, some of us who contest that very surveillance are also sometimes drawn into those dichotomies or trichotomies as well, because we get traction by showing how overly broad the surveillance is. So I'd love to hear from some of you um, who might contend with that tension in your work. Um, maybe Janet can at least talk a little bit about what's happening in the current state of religious studies with regard to that dichotomy. So thank you again for inviting me to participate in this discussion today. I learned a great deal from the book. I look forward to the rest of the discussion this evening, as well as to seeing the conversations that this terrific book continues to generate. With that, I think everybody's going to come on. So welcome back, everyone. Karen, first of all, thank you for that very clear um, discussion and set of questions. Um, as we now move into uh, responding to them, I can't uh, tell you how much I appreciate the ways in which you were able to lay things out uh, so clearly. Um, so what I think we're going to do right now is give everyone a chance uh, to respond. I'll go last. So I'll come back around to the religion question that you asked at the end, I promise. Um, and then we can see where we uh, want to go from there. Um, but um, uh, Vasuki, uh, is, is Billy Holiday, is your cat still there? Also, I do yes. want to give give time for the cat, whose name for the audience is Billy Holiday. Respond, <laughs> should the cat want to. But why don't you go ahead and start us off, and then Shanila, Lila, and then I'll go last. Uh, OK, sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, Billy doesn't perform on command, so. <laughs> <laughs> She she may intervene, but uh, but she prefers to do it uh, subversively at her own uh, at her own uh, when she's okay, most disruptive. Um, okay, so thank you so much, uh, Karen. As always, um, I think the, there's a, a both tough and fabulous questions to think with, uh, and so um, so thank you. Um, so I don't know whether I can do justice to those questions, but let me sort of quickly perhaps have some quick responses perhaps to each of those. So um, maybe with the criminal law, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I think this does raise questions about the particular, you know, I think that the particular role of international criminal law perhaps doesn't map 
precisely onto the question, of course, of domestic criminal law, but there are important um, important resonances in terms of, um, you know, the ways in which, you know, certainly the discussion around criminal law in the U.S., where we have talked about the relationship between courts and policing, uh, and here, you know, it, uh, as I started with the, with the discussion of um, a NATO countries, military intervention, and and the ICC having a particular nexus, and I think so. I think some of those uh, there's both re resonances and 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 distinctions. Um, the one thing I would like to say is, um, in some sense, what I wanted to put on the table with this chapter is not only the ICC, but about liberal legality more generally, um, because you know what one of the things I trace, for instance, with um, the uh, the way in which um, the NATO operates and their sort of rule of law field operation um, is that it's about deciding what counts as law and what doesn't count as law. So you know, from Mali to Afghanistan, they often treat alternative legal systems as being um, as really systems of criminality as not really legal system. So that I also want to talk about, I guess I want to draw attention to the constructed nature of what is and isn't law and the way in which that's part of what is at stake in some sense. Um, and so um, so that's slightly different in some sense from the criminal law abolition stakes, um, but also also not, not unrelated. Um, but anyway, let me leave that there and sort of go to the next one about the feminism. Um, what are the other feminisms at stake? Um, I mean, in this particular case, I mean, certainly there was, you know, there have been, I mean, as I, I think here also, there may be certainly a, re a resonance with the with the um, uh, uh, pacifism question or certainly the anti-war, the militarization, um, the um, as well as the sort of pluralism that, you know, many people have been, of course, protesting. I mean, not not audibly often uh, in the halls of security council but certainly protesting the militarization in the name of um in the name of feminism um although of course the loudest voices are the fact that there are feminists who are uh, attentive to it if i can give a different kind of resonance in terms of the mali con uh, reference in the mali conversation in particular i don't know whether um for those of you who haven't seen the film timbuktu um by Abdurrahman Sisako, I'm probably uh, massacring his name, um, but that film is quite powerful. Actually, going directly to your question, uh, um, Karen, because it speaks about these alternative women um, and gendered ways of uh, uh, in in the in the in his film that are um, that speak in some sense that's go that speak. Um, that both are not assimilatable into this international conflict feminism enterprise, but also, of course, uh, uh, take on the the, the uh, Ansardin and other local um, um, Islamists who are trying to change, in some sense, uh, not local external Islamists who are trying to change local Islamic practices, um, in some sense. So, um, but that's um, and and speak instead about sort of um, domestic feminist traditions and of course with the same rule of law and military operations that came into Mali was preceded by the president of Afghanistan, the, uh, 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 the operations in Afghanistan where of course groups like Rawa, again, not 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 heard that much these days, but groups like um, uh, Rawa have been um, altered, uh, offering an anti-imperialist feminist vision um, quite consistently uh, in many ways. Um, and then um let me see the final final question was uh, are the good muslim bad muslim um i mean yeah i mean i guess i i shouldn't i i just stop I'll stop there but, but just one one sort of um i mean I, not quite a not, not um a, i mean that, that certainly is you're right that that's exactly that is partly what's at stake and um i some of you may have uh, uh seen this but there's this uh, u.s marine corps commander joseph nala who gave this very sort of notorious Pentagon press briefing um, a few years ago um, about operations in Afghanistan, where he's criticizing the Taliban, and he say, and he says, "We are the ones who are protecting Islam. We are the ones who are defenders of good Islam, and we are the Mujahideen." Uh, so this is the U.S. A US military officer. Um, so yeah, that's certainly what is partly at stake. And just like with the law question, trying to define what law is, there's also an effort to try and define what um, what, what Islam is. So let me stop. No, thank you. Shanila. 
Thank you, Karen, um, for this question. I look forward to reading your work. Um, so as I mentioned, um, at, so my interest in the chapter peaked when um, I saw that uh, Kandil Baloch became a household name um, after her murder and um, the fact that it was instantly termed as an honor killing. Um, of course, um, she had been a minor social media celebrity even before um, that there wasn't as much um, work done on her, but um, instantly there is uh, a lot of international media attention and of course attention within Pakistan as well. And so um, that kind of led me into looking at how is this possible that a minor celebrity or uh, a minor working class girl becomes an icon for a feminist movement um, and the same sort of feminists who probably wouldn't have paid attention to her earlier and actually didn't pay attention to her earlier. Um, and so I think that's the that's the space where I was trying to figure out what's happening, um, the kind of feminism and feminist theory um, that looks to the state to then continue to provide um, well-being for women. And I would also say that the state in Pakistan is a powerful actor, and so we can't fault feminists uh, or women's rights activists using particular conventions, legal conventions, humanitarian conventions, and, and calling on the state to perhaps implement some of those um, conventions and create some space for women to breathe. Um, but then I think there are other ways of um, enhancing women's well-being. And I talk a little bit about them towards the end of the chapter where women are trying to figure out um, what are some of these specific reasons due to which these violences might be taking place. There are also groups that look to the Quran um, to figure out ways in which one can engage in mutual um, accountability without actually um, seeking incarceration and without calling on to uh, calling for an expansion of carceral ecology. And so I think that's the space. I mean, you have to do more research on that, but there are these possibilities. Um, and so that's that's something that I was interested in thinking more about. And I think in relation to the good Muslim, bad Muslim, um, you're right. I think one of the perhaps discomfort um, that most of us also have is that some of this violence um, gets transformed into the question of religion. Um, and I think some of the chapters in the book do a really good job in talking about these instances um, as as space, as violence that might happen in the U.S. too, and why does one get coded as religious and not? And so I think that's also something that's stake um, for a lot of us as we are looking at this. Thank you, Lila. Mm, thank you, Karen. These were uh, you not only had the questions, but uh, told us what you thought. And I think these are really important ones. I think I leave the criminal law to people who know something about that. Uh, so maybe <laughs> Basuki and Chenila can come back to that uh, because it's not my forte. But I think the question of what kind of feminism is really important. And I don't, I was trying to think why just to start, that one of the reasons you're asking that, and of course I've read your work and I've read Kitty McKinnon and, you know, I know what this debate is about and these classifications uh, that you're talking in your book, uh, this grip of sexual violence and conflict, you know, that was about sexual violence. And I think you pointed out at one point that very few of us actually talk about that in this book. Um, you know, we're talking about broader kinds of violence and we we haven't focused i think uh, maybe rima has the most interesting take on that in looking at humanitarianism uh, feminist humanitarianism in gaza and this kind of will to find the sexual violence which they didn't couldn't find uh to blame the local community for that you know they were looking for it and it wasn't there but i wanted to actually take up I think you're really right to make us think about this. And it makes me think of what kind of feminists. And so I was thinking like, what kind of feminists am I talking about when I 
talk about Securo feminists. Mm. And I think there were many, many different kinds. I don't think they were all McKinnonite carceral feminists at all. And I think there are human rights feminists who were, these are women, most of them, I guess, women uh, who I actually respect, respect their thoughtfulness, respect their commitment. Um, and so the problem for me was, what's happening here? Why are these feminists, who I don't think are the hardline radical, you know, whatever you, what do you call them, structural feminists, the you know McKinnon type feminists, I don't think these are them that I'm talking about either. For the, it was a very heterogeneous group, so it includes you know really major legal scholars that we all respect, Fanula Ni. Arlen, who I didn't realize at the beginning was as prominent and interesting as she is, um, and very thoughtful and very, you know, serious about this and not a carceral feminist in any kind of way. Um, it includes Third World, the the Wassel, the group that was all women from the Third World who then promoted themselves as, uh, you know, possible leaders against CVE. And I'm thinking, so my problem with it all is that, you know, I actually don't think it was, this is driven by a certain line of feminism or feminist thought, but it is many groups somehow getting themselves caught up in institutions that themselves and political dynamics that themselves are the problem. Uh, and they're attaching themselves in trying to promote feminist goals and uh, they are I think Vasuki used the word conscript, conscripted I don't use that word I was thinking about you know um, Janet Halley's uh, I think we talk about that in the introduction the five C's of governance feminism and I couldn't remember the fifth one but you know collaboration complicity co-optation compromise and I forget what the fifth one was um, you know, and it's, it, that's not actually what I'm so worried about is, you know, co being co-opted, uh, as attaching themselves to political institutions and dynamics that are really the harmful things in the world. And by trying to insert gender into those, they're not seeing the those are the problems. So criminal law might be one, you know, carceral uh, international criminal court that actually only selectively uh, prosecutes all of that. But that's where I'm trying to figure it out. It's just almost unwittingly or because they care so much to mainstream gender and to make these issues, you know, people to see them as important, they're latching on to the wrong <laughs> you know, to institutions that are not about anybody's safety or well-being. Um, so that that's sort of the way I've been trying to think about it. Um, and it's very, it's a little bit different um, because it's those institutions that are the problem that I think they should be working against. And you mentioned, you know, pacifists and there's that wonderful ethnographic work by Cohen about how the UNCR, you know, 1325 came into being at the UN where those people who had different kinds of arguments were perceived as too political and would stand in the way of getting this resolution for women, peace and security passed and get these feminists to the table and women's issues on the table, um, that was not exactly compromise. I mean, it was an exclusion of certain issues in order to get the bigger goal of just getting a feminist voice in there, getting women to be cared about. And I think of Pinola's, uh, you know, she's the special rapporteur in the promotion and protection of human rights and freedoms while countering terrorism. Well, why, why, you know, you can't protect human rights while countering terrorism. 
so all the brilliant work that she does and all this research and all these consultations, which you kindly invited me to one of, you know, which is really enlightening. I really admire this work, but I think, no, you know, why is that where we have to speak? Um, and, you know, we talk in the introduction about, you know, the price of inclusion or the, you know, if you're excluded, you can't affect anything. Well, I just don't know. I just think I would rather be excluded and try to push for the things that I think are important in a bigger sense than to attach myself to these institutions, which you know. I mean, like Shanila's paper, even for Pakistan, right? Why, you know, ally yourself to the state? Is that really <laughs> going to help uh, the kinds of causes you want? And it's never been our necessarily our friend, but we get caught up in all kinds of other things once we hitch our wagon to them. So that, that's that been my interest, and I really appreciate your sort of bringing it up. And I was just trying to think, you know, what are we trying to do? Um, maybe that is a compromise, but I think we haven't quite come to the carceral feminist, you know, McKinnon line the dominance of that line because none of us really were, were looking at sexual violence. I mean, Vasuki's case is one, I suppose they still call it gender and there's forced slavery and all of that, but um, we weren't actually studying it that much. Um, criminal law, leave aside, good Muslim, bad Muslim. I think that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it this way. A lot of people do think about the ways we have to kind of distance ourselves from the extremist Muslims because good Muslims are very different. But um, what I wrote about in my chapter was sort of how, um, you know, the initial CVE was really about men and then feminists got confused because women were joining these groups and how do you explain that away because these are supposed to be gender violent extremists so why would women choose to go join them for the caliphate or whatever the migrants uh and many of them were converts you know the whole thing was a little bit confusing to them but what i worried about was that and usually they excuse they were lured by the media they were looking for romance you know there was all these psychological and cultural explanations for why they would do something so so crazy because it was against their own interests. But I worried and showed some of the studies that have been done that when people started trying to analyze these women extremists, uh, they ended up sort of putting everyone under the sign of extremist Islam. There isn't anything else. Uh, and that's the danger of it, you know, very small numbers, but all of us are under suspicion. So, um, but I think it's a really, yeah, it's a really an important question that you asked. So thank you. Thank you, Lila. And I, um, well, I, I'm going to try to talk about each of the three uh, questions as well. And I just want to thank all of you for this rich thing. I, when Karen finished, I had a very sort of bullet pointed approach. And then as each of you talk, I talked, I took more notes. So um, uh, I'm not sure I can make it fully uh, cohere, but I'll give it a go. Um, and I do want to start with the question of is, is criminal law the problem or is the state the problem? I certainly am um, committed to the idea that the nation state system uh, as a whole is, uh, you know, it's naturalized and it doesn't have to be. Um, and that uh, thinking about uh, the abolition of that system, not even necessarily states or governments or the like, but that system could be uh, particularly helpful. And I will go, you know, two directions on that. One, long ago when I started working on this issue, I wrote an essay called is secularism less violent than religion, which was the assumption that was the statement all over the US public discourse after 9-11. And the answer was, of course, no, because if the state was secular, then the violence done by all of these wars was massively greater um, than anything that was done uh, by religious actors um, in particular ways. 
Um, and that argument has developed in ways that I think have important uh, feminist implications, particularly we had at BCRW uh, 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 an event led by uh, our colleague Manajee Maradian uh, recently on the Gina Re revolution and it was organizers and, and scholars a year after um, you know, the development of that feminist uprising in, in Iran. And the question wasn't whether the state was secular or religion, the problem was the state. And part of the conversation that they're trying to have is can we have, let's just not even critique the binary, right? Which was, you know, the project for a long time in certain form of feminist theory, but can we have a wholly different conversation? Um, and that um, different conversation opens up space for other types of uh, living, of action, of political action even um, that, um, you know, in one way sidesteps that it's in, uh, I like to imagine that we've, that even though Lila said at the beginning, this critique has not taken off as it might. These institutions are powerful. I think that's why. Um, and we have not fully been able to hold the, hold the line, but it's also the case that the sticking with these critiques over these past decades, I think has created a space for people to say, okay, I don't have to make that critique. I can build a set of questions that really don't have to decide good Muslim, bad Muslim, don't have to decide, is this religion or is this secular? Shanila, when you said, how does something get coded as religious or secular? You know, one of, I have other arguments about how there's all kinds of things, uh, including the state that are coded as secular that we could code as religious and uh, vice versa. Um, and sometimes we might wanna claim things as uh, religious that, you know, all, all types of things that are associated, for instance, with queer life that we might, easily claim as religious that are secular simply because they're in some way um, um, seen as, as queer. Um, the other point I wanted to make was about the, the, the attribution of extremism, because again, I think that one way to address that is not by saying, and here's the good religious actor, the bad religious actor, but to say that extremism isn't the problem. I'm currently working on a book on uh, um, a, a book proposal actually on white Christian nationalism. Um, and the point of that book is not to have another book about extremism and extremist religion, but to argue about the ways in which populist movements, authoritarian movements that we see in the US are actually tied to things that are white Christian and nationalist at the heart of US society. That it's what I call the squeamish center that lives in between a set of uh, principles that might point to liberation and yet remains tied to whiteness, Christianity and, and nationalism in ways that actually allow uh, for the continuation of what's called extremism and, and has trouble um, saying that, 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 that that's a problem except in its extremism. In other words, extremism is a way to claim a set of problems without having to name them as white, as Christian and as nationalist, but instead just to say that the problem is in the extremism. Um, and so, uh, you know, for me, the squeamish center is as much a problem as, as the extremism. And that if we could focus on um, that question, we would get a better picture of uh, hegemony of how it works and of the forces that, 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 we, might, that we might be up against. So, um, you know, uh, those are a few of my thoughts uh, uh, in response to both uh, your wonderful questions and everybody's wonderful responses. And Karen, I wanna ask you now, do you have any other questions? We have five minutes or so left that you wanna bring or anything you wanna say? Um, well, thank you all. I didn't, I, I appreciate that all of you answered all the questions. <laughs> and and uh, now I'm good sure that you all might have other comments for each other too, because uh, I saw different ways in which you all we're connecting, but maybe a little bit of tension as well. But I just wanted maybe to go back to the feminism question because I've also been working to try to revive some of the actually Cold War peace mm -hmm. feminism. And in tracing, and I, and I wanna maybe push you a little bit, Lila, on the, because I don't think the distinction is so great between gender-based violence and sexual violence. I mean, I think that first there was the approach on gender-based violence, and then for many that became sexual violence. 
But I think that the carceralism was around gender-based violence more broadly and pretty early on, especially um, if you think about it, this, I mean, yeah, Gruber's done a lot of this work, but just in the US and then people have traced it also in other places as well as in the international system. And one of the things that I've been sort of throwing out there as a potential argument, I, based on a few, a few archives I've been looking at, is in the, toward the end of the Cold War, feminists had been, well actually, yeah, we didn't know it was the end of the Cold War, so we could even say in 1985, during the UN World Conference on Women in Nairobi, there was a big push, there was a peace tent, which was like the NGO forum next to the NGO forum, and the, you know, and, and so this is where this is a lot of the feminism, a lot of it was cultural feminism. I think some of it was liberal feminism. I think probably less of it was the structural bias feminism than we see elsewhere. Um, and they were really at the peace tent. They wanted to get women together from different countries that were in conflict with each other to talk to each other with the idea that you know, it was that citizen exchange idea that they, they could show that women could make peace in a way that men couldn't. And then there was suddenly the question about what was feminist about that. And the Reagan administration in particular was coming to the conference and Maureen Reagan was coming. And so I found this memo where one of the people who was behind the peace tent said, now what do we do? They're saying that peace is not a feminist issue. And then you started seeing a lot of discussion about the relationship between interpersonal violence and international violence. And I'm kind of like, what well, I'm trying to figure out why did the interpersonal violence stick and the international violence didn't. Now, if you were to ask me what's the feminist theory around that, I'd have the same problem that you know you all had in answering me, because it's as I said, it was a mix of feminisms. I don't know that it was the feminism that really held people together as much as it was the politics and the ideas about peace. Although they certainly saw that as a part of feminism and maybe we need to take that seriously and examine that more closely too. Okay. Um, I'm going to, Lila, one last comment since you are our um, uh, uh, organizer and also since uh, you know this conversation between you and Karen was uh, generative, and then uh, we're out of time. So, Lila, anything you want to say here at the end? Oh, uh, well, I mean, obviously, there's a lot to talk about, and I really appreciate okay. everything that people have said, and especially this last set of comments, and my head is spinning, just thinking about what feminism was that it isn't now, uh, which was around women, uh, in a way that I don't think, you know, I think that has changed since 1985. There was a problem of women, third world women versus uh, Western women at those conferences and what were the issues that really mattered. Um, but I think the whole landscape has changed as well now with, um, you know, in, including uh, as we barely did in this book, uh, which we, wished we had done more of with Seema's uh, contribution in terms of trans and queer refugees in Turkey. Uh, and, you know, we stopped ourselves short to think, yes, not just women. Uh, so that's one thing that's changed and that might open up a different kind of feminist politics, uh, which is almost what Janet was talking about, uh, that, you know, other possibilities open up when we don't have to think just about women, but think about humans of different sorts and marginal, where that, what Vasuki said about intersectionality, it was from the bottom and now it's from the top. You know, we need to think about this new landscape. So I just appreciate it. And I just wanted to say thank you, uh, Karen, for really thoughtful questions. Thank you, uh, Vasuki, Janet, uh, Shanila, for being part of this and Rafia too, who taught us a lot and all the other contributors to this book. And I hope people, as Janet said, we will be posting this as a, um, you know, the recordings and we're gonna be trying to 
uh, do all the recordings from the three launches so that everybody gets a chance to hear the different kinds of conversations that occurred around the book and the different contributions to it. So just thank you so much. And yeah. thank you everyone for coming. We can't see any of you, but we hope you're there. <laughs> Yes, and thank you, um, everyone, and an opening to further conversation um, and the QR code on the screen right now, which we'll leave up for a minute, even after we as people go away, um, uh, so that uh, it's an opening to further reading, to further conversation, uh, um, and uh, which is the best of uh, all of these BCRW events is that they do, in fact, really go someplace, and this conversation certainly did. So thank you, everyone, and good night. <laughs>